Good morning and happy Sabbath. Let us lift our voices in songs of thanksgiving to Jesus this morning. next song, The Power of Your Love. Renew 
Good morning, Happy Sabbath, church family. Um, we got a few announcements today. You'll notice in your bulletin there's Add Your Voice. Um, and from up here, you guys all sound great. So if you guys want to join or form a choir, um, encourage you to fill this out. Alan Glover um, will be uh, putting that together. Uh, we now have an announcement about Pathfinders by Don. Oh, Luann and Don. Well, what a day to announce this. There's hardly any Pathfinder age kids here today. But anyways, we are so grateful. We're going to be starting up again this Tuesday. New time, 3.30 to 5.30. We want to be able to accommodate our non-church school kids. Um, and I'm also excited to announce concurrently that we are starting Adventurers the same time, same day. So we again, 3.30 to 5.30 and it's going to be great. Pathfinders is 5th uh, grade to 10th grade. Adventurers, we will be accommodating kids from ages 4 to 9, which I do see quite a few of them here today. So that's awesome. And Erica Lopez and her family, and hopefully, I think Marla, they'll, they'll be helping with the adventurers. So we need your support. If you've done Pathfinders in the past or scouting, uh, or if you have a particular skill set that you'd like to share, we definitely need your help in both, um, both clubs. Thank you so much, and please pray for us. This is a very, very important service for our kids. Thank you so much. Uh, Erica, do you got an announcement? Happy Sabbath. Um, our Harvest Festival is coming up pretty fast, and I put in the bulletin a little schedule so you don't miss the auction, and we're going to have a live auction as well, so please take a look at that. And then we also have a, I'm still looking for some more donations of cookies, chili, and cornbread. Miss Barr back there has a sign-up sheet, so if you know a good cornbread recipe, please come up and sign up. Thank you. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. I just want to clarify a uh, item from last week. We had a presentation on Native American prison ministries, and uh, I don't want you to go away with the idea that uh, the whole purpose of that is to help an individual, uh, a particular individual with their um, uh, predicament that they may find themselves in. But Native American Prison Ministries and uh, our elders will be in discussion of maybe expanding that ministry to just include Native American ministries or maybe just prison ministries. Um, the idea is to help people that find themselves um, uh, on, in, in a particular place in their life that they are incarcerated and now where do we go from here? And the gospel is meant to reach even those people uh, behind bars, amen? amen? And that's what that is for. And um, if you give towards that, uh, the focus will be on helping with Bible studies, with um, uh, commissary for those people in jail, uh, for support for their families as they, as they travel back and forth to uh, meet with their loved ones in person. If you're not aware, if you try to uh, uh, contact a person in jail, it seems like everything is done over the phone, and that is a subscription that the families have to pay for, and those who are behind bars have to pay for, so it can be very expensive for them to do uh, phone calls and video calls. And so those are the kind of things. If you have any questions on Native American prison ministries, uh, just contact one of your pastors or one of the elders and we'll make sure we answer your questions. Just a clarification after the presentation last week. Thank you.
Our opening hymn is number 44, Morning Has Broken. You know, please stand. with me dear father we're just so ever thankful that we can come together and worship uh, your name lord i just pray a blessing upon us that are here gathered uh, under your name but also be remember the ones that aren't able to be here lord i just pray you be with the message today and bless it lord in jesus name i pray amen you may be seated Today's offering is uh, for the Dakota Challenge. The New York Conference has a church school near the office uh, location. A conference officer who visited saw many students were wearing only one glove. Why are so many wearing only one glove, he required. We share our gloves with immigrant students. They don't have gloves of their own. When we share, we can go outside and play in the snow. Each student has one hand in pocket and one hand in a glove. The conference leader could scarcely believe the unselfish actions of the students. He investigated further and found that some students had no socks or proper shoes for the winter. He hurried and sent the information about the immigrant students and their needs through the conference donations uh, rolled in for socks, shoes, gloves, coats, and sweaters. By the end of the week, these precious children of God received warm clothing that they needed. When we, as conference, come together for the Lord, great things will happen. Many needs are too great for one person to meet, but working as a team, we accomplish great things. Today's offering is for the Dakota Challenge. Will the deacons please come forward? Dear and Father, Lord, um, just ask you be the offering now, Lord, that is collected. We give freely to you, Lord. Um, we give it um, as an individual, but it comes together as a collective. And we just pray that uh, you guide the offering um, where you see fit, where the need is uh, much needed, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
All right, it's time for our children's story, uh, the kids' favorite part of the service. Uh, Kibben will have their story today, so the kids can come up, and after they're done, they'll pick up a lamb's offering. Good morning. Um, I'm, I, I got some older kids here and I got some younger kids. I'm going to pass some stuff out and hear later when I'm done. And oh, hopefully you guys just share. I think there's family units here. And um, I'm, I don't have a magic trick today, but I have something that eh, make you think. And that's what I'm going to... First of all, I'm going to tell you a Bible story about making you think. Because... I've heard this same story so many times, and, and so that's why I'm, I'm talking to you today, that you're going to come to this church or another church probably your whole life, and you'll hear the same story out of the Bible. I, I grabbed this Bible this morning, and you'll, you'll think, oh yeah, I've heard that story over and over, and, and then one day you'll be listening to the speaker, and they'll tell the story, and you thought, Oh, that's not the way I thought it was. So here, I picked a story. There's many of them, but the one I picked, I think you guys have been learning the Sabbath school. It's about a little girl that was taken captive by a bunch of soldiers. They grabbed her out of her home. They took her to a different land, a different country, and she had to work for this soldier's wife. And I don't think there's a name given to her, but... Anyway, it turns out that she worked for the soldier's wife. She didn't necessarily work for the soldier that took her. And what's very interesting about the story is that, you know, she's made into a slave, and yet she decides to be kind to this, these people that she lives with. And it turns out that the soldier that took her, his name was Naaman. And he had a bad skin disease. They called it leprosy. Oh yeah, it's like when your skin starts to actually rot, gets bloody and scabby, and it gets all over your body. And it turned out that this little girl talked to, 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 to the lady she worked with, which was the wife, and said, Naaman, I, I, I know a guy back in my country that can heal him, okay? And to finish the story quickly, um, I'm gonna say that Naaman come in and said, what's she talking about? And the woman says, she knows somebody back in her country that um, is a prophet, he serves God, and he can heal you. Now, the part of the story here that I always just smooth out is that, first of all, have you heard this story? Have you heard the story about Naaman? Okay, some do, remember? Okay, did Naaman run, go out of his house, get his chariot, you know, that's like a wagon with horses, jump and go see Elijah. I always thought he did. Oh yeah, I'm going to ask the group of people out here. Did Naaman just go and find Elisha? Do you want me to pick on anybody? Uh, okay, I'm going to go with the lady in front that says no, so we'll believe her. But if I had to pick people and say, well, what did Naaman do? Okay, it matters though. Because the part of the story that was very interesting is that Naaman went to his boss, who was a king, and said, I have this little girl that works in my house. Okay, and he did say that. Now I'm going to paraphrase. He did say, he, the, the king said, okay. Now I'm paraphrasing. And the and king might have asked, it's not in the Bible, said, a slave girl? And Naaman probably said, yeah. And the king goes, and she wants you to do what? And Naaman said, I'm paraphrasing, she's a real nice girl. She's talking about a guy that can heal me back in her country and her religion. He's a prophet. Now the true thing is, is that the king decided, okay, I'll contact the king of Israel and make this happen. Now I'm going to fast forward. 
He went and met Elisha. Naaman did get in his chariot and horses and go and find Elisha. He dipped in the Jordan how many times? Help me. Seven? Yes. But the part of the story that I'm asking, I asked the people out front here, is that you'll come to church your whole life and you think that you know that story inside and out. And it's not the Naaman story. It could be about King David. It could be about Moses. It could be about Jesus. And if you go to church enough times, you will remember the story and the points that actually matter. So, given that, I told you the Bible story first. But I, I, oh, I left my book. I, I had a book that I bought at a bookstore downtown, and it just said math on it, okay? And I think that I'm a pretty smart guy. And I thought that I've, I know everything about math. Well, not physics and quantums and those little things, but I'm pretty good, I think. And so well, the reason I'm talking about this math book is that I thought I knew everything. And remember, we did our Bible story first. You come to church enough times, you will learn everything. But you'll never learn it all, so you keep coming to church. So that's why I got this math book. I wanted to learn some more. Okay, this is not a round ball. It's not a sphere. It, I call it a circle, but let's just say pancake. And we're going to talk in references to this being like a pancake. And how many sides does it have? Right there, how many sides? Well, let's say for sides, meaning how many sides can I put maple syrup on? Like I can eat it like a pancake. I can put maple syrup on that side. I could put maple syrup on that side. True? So how many sides does it have? It has two sides. How many edges? Did, you ever get a paper cut? You're all in school. You ever pick papers up and then all of a sudden it cuts you right here? You ever get those? They hurt. Okay, so how many sides does that have? How many sides can you get cut on? One. Yeah, this is not a trick question. This is kind of easy, okay? So there's, there's only one side I can get a paper cut on, okay? Um, I called this a square. It's not a cube. How many sides is it you can put maple syrup on? Two sides. Okay. How many edges does it have? Yeah, four, because it's definitive. It, this edge ends at that point. So there's actually four sides. Okay. This here, it's kind of like a, it's called a ring, Okay. And this ring's going to say, how many sides is, can you put maple syrup on? Two sides, okay? How many edges does it have? A little harder here. How many edges? Well, how many places can you get a paper cut? I can get a paper cut in here. And I can, yeah, there's two sides. Yeah. You guys did some of this in school, I'm sure, learning your figures and everything. So there's two sides. Now, this is going to end shortly. I mean, like three minutes. I brought, I got this from Haley that does a great job in a Sabbath school class. It's a little penguin. It's got Walter, okay? And Walter can, I, I traced some purple here. Walter can walk around on top all day long. I, hopefully you can see he's walking the trail. He's walking, walking. But he can never get to the other side because he has to cross an edge. True? So he walks all day long, but he can't get to the other side. The only way he gets to the other side is if he crawls over an edge. And then he can walk where the green part is, all right? He can walk around. Okay. Oh, thousands of years ago. Here, you. Joaquin, can you hold that? You hold Walter. Thousands of years ago, somebody decided that you could make that into something else, and they called it a Mobius. I know it sounds kind of like sparks are going to fly, all right? But they're not, all right? But they called it a Mobius. And hold Walter. Let me, I'm going to make a cut right there, all right? And I brought, uh, now I'm turning it into a Mobius. If I don't get my, here, hold this. If I don't find my tape fast, where did I put my tape? All right, here, it doesn't matter. I got more. 
I cut that one and I taped it right here. Okay? See, okay, give me Walter. Okay? You understand what I did. I cut it and now there's a wrinkle in it. Do you understand? There's no way I could put this back down on the ground without it being, you know, there's a, there's, do you understand? There's a wrinkle now. So you understand what I did to that. What? I, I, I cut it. Go ahead and hold that. I cut it. I cut it and then I put a twist on it. Okay? Now, what it is, I'll give you a few, but you know what happened now? This only has one side. And it has one edge. Do you understand that Walter here can walk all day long and never cross an edge? And he can go, there's only one side. He can go all the way around this all day long. In fact, if I put maple syrup on one spot, you know how you hold it so it drips and drips around? I can maple syrup on the whole thing. On the whole thing. So, you know, this is not going to blow you guys away. It won't. But the fact is, is that you could take something that had two sides and two edges, and I turned it into something that has, there's only one side, and there's only one edge. Because if I take my finger, I can go around that whole, I can go around the whole edge now. And it was just a simple cut. So, back to the story in the Bible. Again, like I say, you'll come to this church and you'll come to many churches and you will keep learning the stories maybe not differently, but you'll start picking up details. Now, we're d before you jump in and grab all those offering things, I'll just, I, there's a family unit here. I'll give you one. And uh, I know what you're going to say. You, the kids are going to put those in the trash and the nerd guy up front is not getting much fun. This was a novel thing, okay? And I'll pass these out and then you can take the offering up, guys, okay? All right, I'm going to give you one to you. One to you. Are you guys in a family unit right there? I'm going to give one to you. And I'll give one more to you guys. And God's will, I'm just... I don't have the tape for this, but I'll give you that, and you can understand. Well, I'm going to say a prayer, and then we'll take up that offering. Dear Jesus, thank you for these children that um, were so polite and listened, and uh, please uh, go with them. In your name, amen. Once again, church family, if you're happy to be in God's house today, say amen. amen. This is the portion of our service where we get to uh, share as a church family our praises and also our burdens and uh, leave them at the feet of Jesus and also on the hearts and minds of those uh, that uh, can intercede along with us. Uh, anybody have something that they'd like to share this morning of praise? Here we go. Okay. Do you know a first name? Eric and Tammy. Eric and and? Tammy. Tammy. Eric and Tammy, I'm sorry. All right. And for cancer. Yeah. Uh, any others that would like to share at this time? 
Uh, how about uh, silent requests? Uh, quite a few of those. Uh, at this time, we'll bow our heads for a word of prayer. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, indeed you are um, a great and awesome God. We sang about you earlier today. We sang thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you are. Um, and Lord, we, we sang about how we need you and, and how powerful your love is. Um, we look at you as our creator God. Um, and uh, we thank you for um, children's stories. Um, that make it plain how much you love us and that you want to be involved in our lives. Lord, we want to lift up uh, Eric and Tammy and that family uh, with a cancer diagnosis. We want to remember uh, those of our, in our midst and our care uh, that are at the hospital and uh, uh, just draw near to them. There's others that are traveling today or uh, they're away from their home church, uh, either attending other services or tending to family business. We just pray, Lord, that you draw near to them and give them a special blessing. And Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit to accompany us today as we talk about the seal of God. And uh, Lord, may um, your uh, clear vision of, of what your word says uh, come out today. And may we see Jesus through it all um, in all of this worship that we bring you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, it looks like we have a few blessings today. We have special music, and we had a math lesson by Kibben. All I gotta say is Kibben must have some amazing pancake skills. Uh, we turn with your Bibles uh, with me to our scripture reading to Revelation chapter seven, verses one through three. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word today. The message I want to share with you today is entitled, The Seal of God. And uh, if you didn't know, uh, since, you're, since you're probably in, in your Bible in the book of Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, Revelation is that book that is the revealing of who? Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of St. John the Divine. It's a revelation that was given to him, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to Jesus, him, to show his servants. Who's the servants? Us. And in particular, it's John, and he gave it to God gave it to Jesus who gave it to, um, to the prophets, the things which much must what? Shortly take place. And he sent and signified it. There's that word, sign, signified it by his angel to his servant John. In fact, he bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all the things that he saw. And so we have this book of Revelation that unfolds before us. And in that scripture that was read, there were those four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. It's north, it's south, it's east, it's west. It's all encompassing. These angels at the end of time are holding back the winds of strife. There will come a day when they will no longer hold back those winds. And the thing that is keeping them holding back the wind, the thing, uh, the, the situation, the, 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 the whole focus of why the winds are being held back, if we look at the, the, the seven seals that were opening up and when the sixth seal was broken, it shows Jesus coming in the clouds and people asking to, to hide their face from the wrath of the Lamb. They wanted the rocks to fall on them and the mountains to fall on them. That was better than facing Revelation's Lamb. And the question was asked, who is able to stand and chapter 7 of Revelation tells you exactly who. That angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God to seal those people at the end time. And so we look at Scripture, and last time we were together, not last time, but the time before, we were talking a little bit about uh, the, the marks and, and the conspiracies and COVID and, and different things and we were trying and we, we kind of breached the subject of, of, of that mark and what it wasn't. And so I want you to know that, that as we try and we attempt to understand, we need to find out what the mark of the beast and what the seal of God is and I want you to know that both, according to the book of Revelation, not according to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not according to, to Pastor Purdy, but according to your scriptures, 
both the mark of the beast and God's seal have to do with what? Worship. The whole thing centers around worship. And so it, it will be no secret as to what either the mark of the beast is or, for certainty, the seal of God. Amen? And so as we speak of things about the time of the end, how many of you believe we're living in the time of the end? It's okay to raise your hand on this one. This is an easy answer. We are in the time of the end. We can look at all the signs and all the wonders that Jesus spoke about in, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 and he shows how close to the end of time we are. And we look at the book of Revelation and we start to see all the things that were prophesied and how they've happened. We see in the book of Daniel as he, as he marches through the kingdom of Babylon and meet a Persia and Greece and Rome and Rome divided and it goes all the way to the end of the time Time, and Daniel's book was sealed up until when? Till the end of the time. We are at the end of time. We are living in this time of the sealing of God's people. You see, the plagues, which are those things that, that the angels are holding back, they're holding back the global uh, um, winds that will affect everyone but don't hurt anything until when? Until God's people are sealed in their forehead. God wants us to be saved, amen? God wants us to make it through, amen? Amen? God does not want us to be deceived. And so as we look at the themes of Revelation, this is right there in the center, and we want to understand what the seal of God is. We also want to understand what the mark of the beast is because we talked a little bit here a few weeks ago about how it's life or death whether or not you receive the seal of God. Is that correct? Is it life and de or death whether or not you receive the mark of the beast? And so God does tell us what both are. And so for us to even comprehend or wonder or worry about what the mark of the beast is, and it seems that more people are interested in the mark of the beast than they are the seal of God, you first have to understand what the seal of God is so that you can understand the counterfeit, which is what? The mark of the beast. And so if we're going to understand sign or a seal or a mark, we need to know what God is talking about. So what is a seal or a mark or a sign? Do you want my opinion or would you like God's word? All right, we will go to God's word. How many of you are familiar with, with uh, Bible software or a Strong's Concordance? Uh, have you ever used one? And so I don't want you to just take my word for it, so you be a good Berean, and after the services today, whether it's sometime this week, you can go look up for yourself and make sure Pastor Purdy isn't feeding you a line on anything. So we want to know what the Bible has to say about a, what? A seal or a mark or a sign and so this is what they mean. And you can look up all the references to seal, sign, or mark in the Old Testament uh, in Hebrew. There's none in Aramaic. There's a little bit of Aramaic in the book of Daniel, but it doesn't have to do with sign, seal, or mark. Okay? So all through the Old Testament, there's references. And I find it very fascinating uh, in, the, in the word sign and the word mark are actually the same root Hebrew word. That should be a really good indicator that a sign and a mark are what? They're the same. They're interchangeable. You can use them uh, typically. Can you do it across the board? Not always, because the context of the scripture that you're reading, and you get in your Strong's, and it'll tell you all the scripture references, and you can read in there, and you can see whether or not that seal 
It's to, it's to, it's to seal up like you do a, 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 a bag, right? Or, or something, you're sealing something up. Um, uh, here in the news, we had, we had a crime scene with a young lady that was missing and then they found her remains and they sealed off the area. So it can mean that, okay? Um, to affix a seal, put a seal on it like you would in a letter in the ancient days. They would drip some wax on the, on the scroll and then they'd, then they'd seal it up and that seal uh, had a, a, a signet on it Seal, sign, you're getting the, getting the idea here. It would have a signet on it, and the only one who could break the seal was who? Well, the person whose sign it was for. And the, and the other person on the, on the originating end, he had permission to address whoever he was addressing. But it showed where it was coming from and often to who it was for. And so we have this, this, this sign or this signet. And so I'll let you pronounce the, the, the Hebrew there. But you notice that it can be uh, uh, to seal up or, or cordon off or whatever, to affix to, uh, and to make an end to. And also it can mean what? A mark. And then the word sign here, 226, uh, it's also related to 225, and you can look that up on your own because you need some homework. But it means a signal, a beacon, a monument, an omen, a mark, a miracle, or a token. And of course, mark is the same thing, but you would substitute the word sign there. And so that's what a sign means in Hebrew. So when you see the word sign in your Bible or seal or mark, quite often they are interchangeable. In, f in fact, more often than not. What about the Greek? Seal. There in the Greek, it means a signet. Uh, the stamp, like it's impressed, like a mark. Uh, it, it, means, it means a seal. Uh, sign, uh, it means an indication, a miracle, a sign or a token or a wonder. Okay, and then the, mar the word mark um, uh, is scratch, etching, stamp, or a sculptured figure, or uh, uh, like a statue. Um, some places it means a monument. And I apologize for charisma, that's my auto spell, auto check. That's not what that is, it sounds like this, and the spelling is different there. Apologize for that slide. Noticing. So those are, those are the meanings of the word. And you can look all through the Bible, and I just want you to see that, that typically you can substitute the word seal or sign or mark. And so when it talks about the mark of the beast, could we talk about the seal of the beast? The sign of the beast? When we talk about the seal of God, could we talk about the sign of God or the mark of God? Uh, you're going to see that that's actually the case. And so when we look at the, uh, uh, the seal of God, typically a, a government or somebody in authority has a seal. And we know like in the, uh, in the modern day here, we have like the President of the United States. You've seen the presidential seal when he gets up to speak at the podium. There's this big seal there with the eagle and the arrows and, and all that stuff. But it, it'll, it'll have not necessarily, who's our president today? Joseph Biden, that's his name. And it has this title. What's his title? President of what? Of the United States of what? America. So it's got, you know, when he presents himself, he's Joseph Biden, President of the United States of America. And so it's got his name, right? His title and his territory. And what you're going to find out is that we have a sign, a seal, a mark, a signature, if you please, of God in the Bible. There's an Old Testament example. If you want to write this down in Ezra 1.1, 1, 1, uh, there's this example of King or Cyrus, King of Persia. 
And so the Bible is rife with those things. It would tell the name, their title, and their territory over and over again. And so God is not going to be much different in this part of his word as he is in that part of his word. And that's just the way it is. It's not a modern uh, invention. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and we're going to go to verse 11. And I want to read this verse because God has different signs for different things. You remember in the creation week, he says, I made the sun, moon, and the stars as what? Signs for the seasons. So you can tell whether it's day or night or what, what time of year it is. All those things are, are a sign, okay? And so he has different things that he uh, um, uh, 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 assigns a sign to, Okay, he attributes a sign to it. Romans chapter four and verse 11, I'll put that Bible verse up on the screen. And he's talking to Abraham and he's gonna give Abraham a sign of something. And so he received the what? A what? Seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was still uncircumcised. And so notice how Paul puts this, that Abraham received the What? Sign which was a seal. That's a New Testament verse talking about and interchanging the two words. So it's not, it's not something that the modern day church has made up that, oh, by the way, we just want to uh, conflate this issue and, and, and we want to uh, assign or attribute everything uh, that, that we think is a sign is a sign. We want to go by God's word, amen? Amen. We want to go by God's word. Keep your finger in the New Testament there, but we're going to flip back to the Old Testament for in the book of Ezekiel, and I'll have you keep your finger there. The book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is an interesting prophetic book, and in fact, it, it, it's talking to God's people and all the things that they were, they were not doing what they were supposed to do. And they were showing abomination after abomination after abomination that was being done, not only in the nation of Israel there, but not only in Jerusalem, but in the temple. And not just in the temple courts, but inside the temple, they were worshiping false gods. That sounds to me a lot like some of the warnings that are given in the New Testament. At the end of time, there will be this, this man of sin that will set himself up in, the, in the, the temple of God, proclaiming that he's God, right? And yet, he's anything but. We see the, we see the uh, woman riding on the beast in Revelation 13, and it's explained that it's this city, it's this power. And she has a cup in her hand and it's full of what? Abominations. Same thing was in the Old Testament that, that in God's sanctuary there were abominations. The sanctuary was a symbol of salvation. And when somebody tinkers with salvation, that's an abomination to God. Can you say amen? And so there in Ezekiel chapter 9, um, that's some excellent reading if you go back. Uh, but I want you to notice here that there's an angel that is told to go out. He says, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, God's holy city, and put a mark on the foreheads could it have been a sign or a seal? Yes. Absolutely. Same word, mark and, and, and sign are the same thing. So he says, put a mark on their foreheads of the men who do what? Sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. You see, there was a plague that was about to come. There was, there was judgment that was about to come. And God said, don't judge everybody until when? I've marked them in their foreheads. And we could have a whole study on what that means to be in your forehead, but, but you understand that it wasn't a literal mark. 
is symbolic of what's going on, and we'll see that a little bit in our study today. In Ezekiel's day, God was going through his people, marking them as faithful. And in fact, they were upset because of the things that were being done in the temple, in the city, in the, 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 the sanctuary itself. And so here we have this idea of God putting a mark on people in order to save them from what? The judgments that would be poured out. And I want you to notice in Ezekiel, it was God's people is where the judgment was going to be poured out. Now God had something to say about Babylon too, but that was after he dealt with his own people. He had something to say about Assyria and, and Tyre and Sidon, and he had all these proclamations against all these nations around. But first, he dealt with who? His people. That should be a good indicator at the end of time. Who is God going to deal with first? He says, hold back those winds of strife. Hold back those plagues. I don't want anything to happen. I don't want any harm to come to my people until when? And in fact, that seal is a seal of protection, a sign of protection, amen? And so we know that there's a seal coming because Revelation chapter 7 talked about it, right? Right? It's the seal of the living God and it goes on God's people. Those are the ones who will be standing at the end of time. So I want you to understand, the Bible says there that an angel was going to do it, but we want to study a few different points here. In Ephesians, and you should have your finger in Ephesians or the New Testament anyway, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says this, who does the sealing, by the way? Don't grieve the what? By whom you were for the day of. The Holy Spirit seals us. So we know who is doing the sealing. Angel simply means messenger. There's a messenger. Can, 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 was Jesus a messenger, by the way? Yeah. Are you and I messengers? Is the Holy Spirit a messenger? He'll lead us into all truth, right? And, and in fact, Jesus says, you can blaspheme God, you can blaspheme the Son, but you better not what? Because he is the one that does what? For the day of redemption. What's, what's the day of redemption, by the way? That's when Jesus comes. That's when he redeems those off his earth. Who is able to stand? Those who are sealed by who? The Holy Spirit. Some people will say, Pastor, the Holy Spirit is the seal. The Holy Spirit does the sealing. Is he involved? Absolutely. Go back. Well, you know, before we go back, I don't have a, a slide for it, but go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse, um, let's go to 21 and 22. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Here is Paul talking about us being established in Christ. You know, are, are you going to be in the kingdom if you're not in Christ? Are you going to be in the kingdom if Christ is not in you? I saw an illustration as I was doing research for this and, and, and it was so beautifully illustrated. He had, he had this bag of granola that was all sealed up and he says, he says that's like us, that's like Adam at creation and, 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 and we were made perfect in the image of God and it was all sealed up and preserved. And then Satan comes along and rips off and breaks the seal and now that all the things that are on the inside of that now become corrupted. And we can do everything that we can do. Can we seal it back up like the factory? 
Who, who can seal us back up? God through the Holy Spirit. And so we, 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 we see this illustration. And so what was on the inside of the bag, we'll, we'll, we'll see corruption unless, unless something happens. And so he has that, that, that other bag of granola and he takes that seal off and he empties it out completely. Jesus emptied himself out for us, didn't he? You see that other bag that the seal was ripped off, Satan comes along and he says, you know what, I don't want them sealing that back up, I'm gonna cut that seal off. And he severs the connection that, that would actually seal us. But Jesus came and he came as a man and he has that seal ripped off because he's walking in our flesh. But Satan does not cut the seal. But Jesus empties himself out and he allows us to be put in him and he seals us with the Holy Spirit. That is the deal. That is the deal. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and, and uh, 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who has what? Sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, but it's, but it's the inside that's, that's, uh, uh, that is changing. Do you see that? Back to Ezekiel in the Old Testament where you should have a finger. Ezekiel 36, 27. God says, I will put what? My Spirit within you, and then what? And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. When we see that the seal of God, the sign of God, the mark of God is, is to have a heart like those people in Ezekiel's day that were sighing and crying because of all the abominations that were going on, all the false worship that was going on, they rejected it and they were brought to tears. God says, I want to put my spirit within you. I want to change things from the inside. We can go to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10. This is the covenant that, I, and then it's quoting the Old Testament. I like it when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, don't you? It means that things are consistent, things, things are eternal. In fact, the gospel of God is eternal, amen? God is eternal, his gospel is eternal, his law is eternal, his love for you is what? Everlasting. It will never, ever fade. This is the covenant that I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put their laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. In another place, he says there in Isaiah, to bind up the testimony and seal what? The law. Okay, it's, it's one thing for us to, to bind the testimony or the law on my hand or put it in a little piece of scripture and, and, and bind it to my forehead. Is that what he's talking about? He says, seal it. Keep it. Write it. Mark it. You know, my wife is a good list, ma list maker. How many of you ladies are good list makers? You know, and you're, and you're going down your list and what do you do when you've accomplished something or you've, you've, you've seen what you've seen, wanted to see or done what you wanted to do? What do you do right beside it? You put a mark. God wants to mark you and me through the Holy Spirit with what? Which is what? His law. Did you know that the law and God's character are the same thing? And we've, we've had sermons on that, and I could talk about that uh, in, in a whole other way, but, but, but there's this binding up, sealing it. Among who? My disciples. And so what is the law that it's talking about? And just briefly here, I want to see I want you to see here 
that, that there is something that God wants to put in our hearts. Do you think he wants to write the Ten Commandments on your heart? Yeah. Inside of the Ten Commandments, inside the law that he wants to bind up, he wants to seal up with the people who he calls his disciples. Jesus says, if you love me, and he says, my commandments are not burdensome. In fact, my commandments are all hinged on love. Love for God, love for man. And in the middle of the law, we find this commandment. It says, in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the what? Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You say, Pastor, what does that have to do with a sign, a seal? Did you notice that the Lord's name is there? Who, who made the, the earth, the heavens, and the seas, and everything that's in them? His name is there. His title is there. He's the creator God, and his territory is everywhere. And he is the one that can bless a day that he wants to put on your heart. I want you to notice something very quickly here in Genesis chapter 2. This is the creation account, and I want you to see if you can pick up on it. It says, thus the heavens and the earth and the host of them were finished, and on the... Keep count here. The seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And we're going to see that the Sabbath is a sign of sanctification. It's a sign of redemption. It's a sign that, that I am his and that my life is no longer mine, but I live it for him. And he says, how are you going to do that? And it's like through my behavior, through my, through my time. But did you notice? Seventh day, seventh day, seventh day. What is the mark of the beast? The number? Six, six, six. Does God have a number? Whenever something is repeated in Scripture, it's for emphasis. God is not going to leave us clueless as to what his seal is. God is not going to leave us clueless of, 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 of why we're sealed and how we're sealed. Over in Ezekiel, once again, it's an excellent book when you're talking about the seal and the mark and, and judgment and, and what the whole issue is over worship. Ezekiel 20, verse 12 says, Moreover, I also gave them my to be a sign, to be a mark, to be a seal between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies. What would be the opposite of God sanctifying me? Me trying to sanctify me. What do we call that? Legalism. We call it self-righteousness. Did you know that the Sabbath is a sign that you can't do it? In fact, the command of the Sabbath is for you to what? Rest, because you can't work for it. No wonder God is using this as his seal. At the end of time, it's going to be critical that we know that we are worshiping God. And we worship God how we want, right? Right? I think God has a way that he would like to be worshipped. We look at the seal of God as it was, it was the Sabbath was given as a sign of his power. We just read the, the uh, chapter 20, verse 12. I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord God that sanctifies them. Deuteronomy 5.15 says, I want you to know that it was me that brought you out of Egypt. Egypt is a symbol for slavery. Did you know that it was God that brought you out of the slavery of sin? And that the Sabbath is a sign that you have been brought out of the slavery of sin. 
So when you keep and celebrate the Sabbath, you're saying, I am God's. He's the one that saves me. He's the one that, that, that makes me holy. He's the one that turns this whole thing around. In fact, Ezekiel 20, 20, if you want to look it up, it says, hallow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Exodus 31, 13, surely my Sabbath you shall keep for it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The Sabbath is a sign of a seal of God that we might know who he is. He gave it as a, a, a sign of his sanctifying power, his redeeming power, his creative power. And no wonder Satan says, I don't think so. As we approach the end of time and we study the three angels message and we'll get into the mark of the beast on another sabbath and it's really hard to do this in a in a in a short brief time but i want you to see that at the end of time it's a test of 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 who you belong to and the seal of god says you're mine and the sabbath is that sign that we are his the three angels' message, when you read them in chapter 14 there, it's all about worship. Worship him who created the heavens and the earth and the fountains and, and, and all that, right? And the contrast is, is that don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't worship the image. Don't worship the beast. It's all about worship. And so as you endeavor to find out more about the sign and the seals and the marks, I want you to know that the main thing that you should get from all of this is that God says you are mine. And out of, out of reverence to him, we say, I am yours. We come and we gather and we worship. And so that's why even the Sabbath uh, convocation, the gathering of the Sabbath is holy to God because it's a sign between him and us that we belong to him. And I'm so thankful for that seal. And we serve a great and awesome God, don't we? And I'll invite our singers up to, to, to lead us in our, our final song. I believe it's How Great Thou Art. Please turn in your hymnals to number 86 and please stand with us as we sing.
Kind and loving Heavenly Father, indeed, how great you are. Um, everything that you've done for us, everything, you, you've redeemed us, you sanctify us, you love us. And, and Lord, what a, what a wonderful sign, what a wonderful seal that you have provided in the Sabbath that we can spend time with you, have relationship with you. Lord, we ask that you seal these things through your Holy Spirit in us once again and take us from this place, loving you and praising you more. In Jesus' name, amen.